But if we put this out as Black Sabbath, you'll sell a lot more records, you'll be doing arenas and theatres. How about it, Tony? The album took three months to make, you know, there was a lot of partying going on, there was a lot of this and that, the other. I've gone through a period of, of, of different people in and out. Are you a spare part in Black Sabbath? I am definitely not a spare part. How they even produce an album, I don't know. And he decided to take a swing at me in the elevator going up to my room, knock me clean out. Uh, so we had to bring in a, another singer. I really don't know if Glenn can get through this tour. That's what Tony said, and we will have someone standing by just in case. People are accepting us very nicely with the new band. I didn't know that, that I had blood in my throat. Somebody told me in that room that night that this man was replacing me. People were saying it doesn't sound like Black Sabbath and it's not a Black Sabbath, because it wasn't a Black Sabbath album. I got a call from Tony Army, a dear friend of mine from my hometown, and and uh, he said, "Would you sing on my solo album?" He said, "We've got Rob Halford and we've got Robert Plant. I'm gonna sing three songs, and you'll sing three songs." I said, "Sure." Black Sabbath had a renaissance in the early 1980s with the arrivals of Ronnie James Dio and Jeff Nichols, that was continued by the Lone Album with Ian Gillan. Ian Gillan would leave Black Sabbath in March of 1984, leaving us with Tony Iommi, Geezer Butler. Bev Bevan, and Jeff Nichols, retreating to Los Angeles the hunt was on for a new singer, Warner Brothers Records would connect Black Sabbath to producer Spencer Proffer, who earlier produced Quiet Riot's smash hit album, Metal Health. American singer Ron Keel was doing demos for his band Keel at the Pasha Studios in Hollywood, which was owned by Spencer, Spencer thought the world of Ron, and marked up a demo reel for Tony Iommi to hear, Ron was introduced to Tony and Geezer, and the trio hung around for a few days, Ron states that the two, and Don Arden all shook his hand and told him he had the job, however, Ron never got to rehearse with the band, being told that Bev Bevan was busy at the time. Tony and Geezer visited Ron after a Keel concert on April 7, 1984, and that was the last time Ron ever saw or talked to either one in person, the demo tape fell on deaf ears, and Ron was never contacted again. Spencer Proffer was unhappy that Ron was passed over, so he decided to leave the project. Around this time, Bill Ward was brought back into the band, another American singer, Dave Donato sent in an audition tape and he was brought in to rehearse with the guys, doing a rundown of ten of the classics, Dave and Bill would hit it off as friends rather quickly. And there was someone called David Donato, who seemed to be in the band for about five minutes and disappear again back into obscurity. That's right, well five minutes was about it really, I think. Um... <laughs> Dave was involved for around six months, rehearsing and writing new material, Kiss and Alice Cooper producer Bob Ezrin would start the demo process, which was a surprise to the band, as they never decided to hire Bob, he just started showing up, none of the new songs were developed enough to record demos, but they went along nonetheless, the track No Way Out would survive in the Black Sabbath catalog, as the main guitar riff would be used in the song, The Shining.
Don't Beg the Master, Sail On, and Dancing with the Devil were some of the other songs that were recorded, Jeff Nichols would recall that these demo tapes were just not hitting the mark for Tony Iommi, nor did he really like Bob Ezrin's way of producing, Dave was a decent guy and singer, with a good bottom end, but his higher registry just didn't have the right amount of power. Dave was never officially fired or told that he had lost the gig. Uh, it, it was one of those periods we were going through that we tried different people and Dave DiNato was when it came along that could sing some of the older stuff and um, we tried him on some new stuff and it just didn't cut it, you know, so uh, we decided to knock that on the head. Dave said that he was getting paid by a check through the mail and that one week he was called to pick up his check at Don Arden's office where he was told that Sabbath wasn't going to work for a few weeks, he asked if Sabbath was breaking up or if they were going with someone else, he was told no, they just had some business affairs to attend to, however, he was never called back again. But of course when he joined the band, Bill Ward rejoined as well, didn't he, for Bill a short Ward, period Bill of Ward time. Bill Ward was with us, uh, yeah, before he... But he, he strikes me as a man with sort of serious problems somehow. Hey, Bill? Yeah. Well, you see, he had a problem with uh, alcoholism, so he's... Uh... It's unfortunate because Bill's a great player, and um, but he enjoys himself now. Uh, but Bill's never been able to be on a permanent basis as far as touring. We didn't take him on a tour properly because we didn't want to get him back into drinking again. Because his old thing, he has to stick to his program mm. of non-drinking and you know go to regular AA meetings and stuff like that. Right. And we found when we brought him to England, when we done the Born Again album, he couldn't find proper facilities for his um, you know to, for his counselling and stuff. He right. couldn't couldn't find proper people here. Like you can in America, I mean, people take care of you a lot because there's a lot of alcoholism there. Right. Well, he eventually fell by the wayside yet again, and also That's he right. was joined then by the original bass player. I hope everyone's following this Geezer Butler, That's who right. went to form his own band called originally the Geezer Butler Band. That's correct. Yeah. This would also be the parting point for Geezer Butler. There were a ton of behind-the-scenes problems, and it is uncertain what Bill's plans were the entire time. Was he going to rejoin full time, or just do an album? Was he going to do any touring? just a lot of unanswered questions, but he would leave as well. Now with his fellow founding members gone, Tony Iommi had to decide if he was to continue with the name Black Sabbath. Gone through a period of, of, of different people in and out, and it, it did get to a stage where you think, well, what, what do I do? I, I, I wanted to do Carry On, and I felt, you know, I hadn't left the band, so I didn't feel I should change the name of Black Sabbath. I, I'd been in the band since day one, and I, it wasn't me, it's everybody else has just gone and come. Um, it was still Black Sabbath as far as I was concerned, whoever was involved in it at that time, that's what I felt. But I, w I wanted to break away and do a solo project under Tony Iommi. Jeff Nichols would decide to stick with his friend. At this time Tony Iommi was engaged to fellow musician Lita Ford, Iommi would borrow her backing band of drummer Eric Singer and bassist Gordon Copley. Studio time was booked and several singers were auditioned, Famed singer Michael Bolton auditioned as well, he disputes this claim but Iommi, Nichols and several others that were involved validate this as true. Yeah, that's a rumor. Um, I think people mix it up because my rock group was Blackjack. That's right. Uh, Blackjack did two albums for Polygram, um, wow, in the late 70s. Mm. Uh, so those were part of my rock years. But okay. So that's a rumor, Black Sabbath. All right. I, I could see it happening. <laughs> well, back then, thank luck. God it didn't, but maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah man. Here comes the long hair again. We, we do have an audio representation of one of the singers that auditioned by the name of Jeff Fenholt. According to him, he more than auditioned. He states that he was given the job and worked with the band from January to May of 1985. This tape that circulates certainly is early form seventh star music, and it's plain to the ear that it is Tony Iommi's playing. There are no photos of Jeff with Tony Iommi, and it has been stated that he never made it past the audition phase. It is important to note that at this time Black Sabbath was on hold, Tony Iommi was firmly creating his solo band, so the Fenholt tapes are incorrectly circulating as Black Sabbath recordings.
Former Kansas producer Jeff Glixman was brought on board. Jeff recalls that Fenholt was brought to his attention by Tony Iommi and Don Arden. Tony had heard a tape of Fenholt's and liked his voice, both Jeff Nichols and Eric Singer agree on the fact that he did do some writing for those demos, the titles and some of the lyrics for Star of India and Eye of the Storm were his. Ultimately Tony wasn't too pleased with the demos and Jeff wasn't called back. In the midst of his solo album, Tony Iommi joins the original Black Sabbath for the Live Aid event at the JFK Stadium in Philadelphia, performing a three-song setlist of Children of the Grave, Iron Man, and Paranoid, it was later disclosed that there were talks for a reunion of the band. We dabbled with various ideas of putting the original Sabbath back together again with Ozzy. And we had a meeting with Ozzy, uh, and we said we'd put the band back together at a particular point, uh, a, a year time from when we met, you see. And then this Live Aid thing came up in between, and, and we'd done that. And uh, then we decided we'd have the meeting again, and we decided we wasn't going to put the original band back together again. Really? Yeah. Because when I saw you together at Live Aid, I thought, this is it. I mean, we saw a somewhat of a Led Zeppelin reunion as well, as much as you could put it back together. But the Black Sabbath reunion, to me, seemed to say, you know, this, it's, it's, it, it, it was similar to what we saw with Deep Purple, but there was just a little something more there, you know, it looked yeah. like it could work again. Well, it, it could have worked again, I think, but uh, we, it wasn't the right time for us, and uh, well, I think our feelings with each other now everybody's been running their own projects so uh, I think they were much more concerned with getting on with their own thing there. It was uncertain if Eric Singer and Gordon Copley were going to stay on for the entire run of the project, but Tony Iommi was friends with some of the most pivotal rock singers, and the idea was to include a host of them rather than just one. I sang three songs in like, I wrote and sang three songs in one evening, and he went, oh my god, well, we got this free time, and I wrote the rest of it in like a few days and I, I, I guess I got the, to sing the whole record, you know. Gordon Copley began work on the album, completing all the bass tracks for the song No Stranger to Love, which did make it to the final product. However Lita Ford went back on tour and he decided to go along with her. Dave the Beast Spitz would complete the bass tracks for the rest of the album. Dave played bass in the band Americade which Jeff Glixman also produced, and it was Jeff that brought up Dave's name. Maricade was a, a, a four-piece group based out of Brooklyn, New York. And it, we, it was a very powerful group. It, it was very short-lived, though, the, the time that I was in the group. And I had gotten a call from a friend, uh, this man Phil Ernst, that I went to school with. And like I said, he was from the booking agency that was, you know, uh, booking White Lion at the time. And he called up, and I hadn't heard from him in a long time. It was really strange. Hey, Phil, how you doing? He's like, well, why don't you come down and jam with these guys? You know, they're looking for somebody like you. And we went down, and we all hit it off like that. I was still in White Lion when I had recorded what is the new Black Sabbath album, The Seven Star. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was supposed to be Tony Iommi's solo record. Mm -hmm. And um, we had recorded the record in L.A., and I went back to New York and White Lion, we were playing a lot of gigs around New York and, you know, we, there was some talk about Tony doing a tour and, you know, it was just pretty much talk. So, you know, we just kept doing our thing and then Tony gave me a call and asked me to join Sabbath. And it was right about the time that we were doing the White Lion video. So they weren't too pleased by that? Yeah, well, they weren't too pleased, so I figured the best thing to do would be, you know, to really wait and see if it was really going to pan out with Tony and stuff, and, and it did. And what happened was we shot the video, it was like a two or three day video shoot at some place in New Jersey mm -hmm. at a theater, and after we finished the video is when I had told the man that I was definitely going to be leaving. So they did their best to slice me yeah. <laughs> right out of the video. Well, I spoke to the guitarist in the band, Vito Brata, yes. and he said to me, this quote to tell you about oh, the selling your departure from the band. Says Vito, I think he made a big mistake referring to you, of course, and I'm sure he realises that now. Let's face it, how much weight does he carry compared with Tony Iommi? I couldn't be a spare part for anyone. Are you a spare part in Black Sabbath? I am definitely not a spare part, and I'm somewhat hurt by this quote from Vito. As a matter of fact, I'll probably give him a ring. Being free of the Black Sabbath name, Tony and Glenn were able to melt together their different styles. You can't deny that Tony's sound will always have touches of Black Sabbath, as his and the band's identity, are the fire and water of each other, and while being a great drummer, Eric Singer doesn't have that thunder of a Bill Ward or Cozy Powell or Vinnie Appice, just like Bill Ward couldn't drum for Kiss. Glenn Hughes will freely admit that he wasn't a good fit for the banner of Black Sabbath. I am not a heavy metal star, a singer, I am not that person. I am a very contemporary singer of great songs. 
so people should understand that don't think that I'm just this hard rock guy because I'm not that I'm that and more you know that mm. but people should know that we're into this very sort of classic rock melodic thing uh, with extremely heavy riffs uh, the difference between, I guess, myself and Ozzy or Dio is, 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 is that I wanted a, a different spin on, on what Tony was writing on the music rather than uh, maybe singing in a, uh, you know, aggressive voice. I wanted it to spin off into something a little bit more melodic and soulful. So here we have what, we, what I consider to be a very melodic album for, from Tony and Glenn. Well, you then set about recording an album. I gather it was going to be a Tony Iommi solo album rather than a Black Sabbath album. Well, basically, I went to, uh, with uh, Don Arden, the manager, I went to, with him to Warner Brothers. And uh, we spoke with Warner Brothers and various people from Phonogram and stuff about, about the project, and they were, they were very excited about it. So uh, here I am writing an album called, t was going to be called Tony Iommi, and I wrote this song with him called Seventh Star. And the, the record was done and um, did a, a typical Sabbath song. It's not what people would expect. Why did you choose that particular track? It's sort of a soft, a ballad-ish type of song. Well, it is really, yes. But uh, I quite like it. Quite like, well, I do like it, mm -hmm. I like it very much. And I think it, it's good as a single too. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good as an album track. The video stars Denise Crosby of Star Trek The Next Generation and Pet Cemetery fame. But she wouldn't be the one to capture Tony's heart. And um, this is Killer. Watch him. Watch him. Watch him. Come on, watch him. This animal is wearing a collar that's registered as a lethal weapon. That's all I want to say about this dog. Why did you bring her here today? Is, is she's in the new video? Is that yeah, the she's in the new video that uh, that we shot a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, this young lady here, she uh, managed to was left in a room with me and um, seemed to start growling at me. And I thought, what a lovely, lovely animal. After you threw her a couple of raw filet mignon, you uh, thought, no, what a lovely depends. animal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I asked if I, could, if I could buy her. As it went on, Tom went on, Black Sabbath was still supposed to have owed Warner Brothers another album. His managers and Warner's thought, well, you know, we could call this Black Sabbath. It was just a bunch of bullshit. And we finished mixing, and then Warner Brothers came in with Don Arden, Sharon's dad, and said, We've changed our minds, we want to call it Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi. And of course, Tony was really upset because this was his opportunity to have a solo album. And I was a little bit upset because I didn't want to sing. And with all due respect, you can't duplicate Ozzy. You can't duplicate Ozzy's tone. And, and oh, oh, I love Ronnie, and, and I just love Ronnie. To, you know, he and I was very, and as I am with Ozzy, it was a difficult period for me to duplicate and emulate that. It was uh, um, Mo Astin, so Mike Austin, uh, president of Warner Brothers' son, who, mm. who suggested that uh, we should still carry on as Black Sabbath and, uh, and use this album as a Black Sabbath album. We got sort of panned quite a lot for that. As people say, it doesn't sound like Black Sabbath and it's not a Black Sabbath, because it wasn't a Black Sabbath album, it was a, a solo project which became a Black Sabbath album. And Seven Stars, a very good record, has held up incredibly well. In for The Kill, which is a real rollicking, rousing rocker. You've, you've got songs like No Stranger to Love, which is a wonderful power ballad, if you want to use that term. Danger Zone, 
and Seven Star itself, these are excellent songs. But as a, as a, the Seven Star record, uh, people should check it out. It's a great album, but it's not a Black Sabbath record. In late January of 1986, Seventh Star was released, with rehearsals for the tour taking place in Los Angeles during February and March, which there is a tape circulating from these rehearsals. Glenn Hughes probably one of the, at that time, greatest drug addicts walking the earth. He pops up on so many people's albums though, Tony, doesn't he? He does a bit and then they fire him. Well, that's right. I think album-wise he's fine, uh, but when he gets onto the road it's, uh, it's another story really, yeah. which we found out. <laughs> <laughs> Different sort of animal. Yeah. I was warned though by the various other people he's, he's been with, you know. Yeah. But, uh, there we go. This is the story I want to tell you and the people in Sweden that I got addicted to cocaine. When was that? When, when did your uh, 1974. Big start? There was a guy that used to follow Deep Purple around on tour, a big cowboy guy in ten gallon hat and guns, and he was uh, supplying myself with with cocaine. And um, I'm speaking very openly to the young people uh, in Sweden because. I want them to know the dangers of hard drugs. It's it's not a glamorization. I'm not here to tell you that it's cute and it's cool because it's not cool. The one-time Sabbath singer Ian Gillett, Ray replaced Glenn Hughes, who severely strained his vocal cords during some shows last week. It all happened because Ray, who sang with the New Jersey band Rondinelli, who's Bobby Rondinelli's band, Rondinelli used to be with uh, Rainbow. Anyway. Ray is an old friend of Sabbath bassist Dave Spitz. Now, when Ray visited Dave backstage after Sabbath's New Jersey Meadowlands gig last week, Dave introduced him to guitarist Tony Iommi. He auditioned for Tony on the way to the next show, and Ray got a standing O from Sabbath fans at the New Haven, Connecticut Coliseum. And Tony says Ray is now Sabbath's permanent vocalist. Great break. Now, Tony, you decided to make Glenn a full member of Black Sabbath, despite the fact he had a track record that was far from spotless, to say the least. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> we did uh, go in knowing that, really. Uh, thought, well, we knew of Glenn's reputation as far as not being very reliable 
so we thought, well, let's give him a, a try and, um, and really see if he can cut it. And he was, he seemed like he really wanted to do it, and uh, he could cut it. But of course, as soon as uh, we'd done, he'd done the album fine. I mean, we had a few problems. Yeah, with he sings very well on the record. We should say that. Uh, and he is an excellent vocalist, but uh, as soon as he got to touring situation, he was, he just couldn't handle it. I lied to people. I lied to my family. I let my body get big, and you know, I didn't care about myself. I wasn't eating the wrong foods. I was drinking the wrong. I was just everything I was doing wrong, you know. But it took me 18 years to, oh, sorry, yeah, 18 years to uh, to clean myself up. Doug Goldstein went on to manage Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, but Doug Goldstein was hired as a security guy. I mean, really trained security man. He wasn't just like a, a dude you meet in a bar that could be big enough to be a security guy. Yeah, he was yeah. a trained right. security man. Who later went on to manage Guns N' Roses, the early Guns N' Roses, with Alan Niven. Doug was hired to literally be with me 24-7 adjoining rooms he, he, he had a thread on the, the hat on the on the knob on the door if i left the room so i couldn't do any drugs then i could drink a little bit and this this guy slept in the next room we had into joining rooms and um, we put things on his door so if he come out of his door we'd know he's gone out just to make sure he's okay you know yeah because he did have a habit of just disappearing and, you know, you don't know if he's going to come back. Would you say that Glenn Hughes has now cost you a lot of money because he's no longer in the band anymore? Oh, I would say it's probably cost us about three or four hundred thousand, yeah. yeah. And when I went on the road, lo and behold, a God shot. God pulled me away from that thing because I wasn't supposed to be doing it. And uh, I got into a bit of a fracas with the production manager and he decided to take a swing at me in the elevator going up to my room. Knocked me clean out. I'm not blaming the guy that hit me in the face. I can't take it back. I can't redo it all, you know. That, that guy died a year later. I don't, I've never condemned the guy for beating me. He lost his life. I don't have any resentment towards him. Mm. I've actually made amends to him. When he, was, he died, I had to go to where he was buried. Oh, wow. I, because, you know, maybe I did something to deserve a, mm. uh, in his mind a black eye. I, I didn't want to have one. Uh, I didn't threaten to uh, you know, kill his mum or something. Yeah, or right, shag right. his... whatever. Yeah. But he broke this bone here that went into my nasal cavity. Well, we took him out into the first week of the tour, first ten days or whatever it was. Um, Glenn was... Uh, he was just in bits. He, his vocals... He just couldn't sing. His, in fact, Jeff, Jeff Nichols had to take over on vocals while Glenn was sort of standing there, really. We should have known at Meadowlands, people were going, well, Glenn can't even talk. He just didn't, couldn't get any words out at all. And we sent him to different doctors, and we had doctors come into the shows. We sent him to psychiatrists. You name it, we sent him there. And basically, it seemed like he'd got sort of a, such a fright. He was so frightened. Um, I don't think he'd been on stage in that scale since Steve Purple, since 1970. No, he hasn't really toured since those days. I don't think. Not seriously. Or whatever yeah. it was, wasn't it, 74? Anyway, it was a very, very tough moment for us, and Tony did the right thing by replacing me with Ray Gillen. May he rest in peace. When, when we were in rehearsal stages, just before we went on this tour, um, the bass player I got with the band now, Dave Spitz, mm. is from New York as well, yeah. and he, he heard this uh, chap, uh, Ray Gillen, in a, a club playing there, and he said he's really good. And uh, so I had his phone number, and I asked Dave, I said, well, get him a, get a tape of him so I can have a listen. And Ray wasn't too pleased on giving us a tape. He said he's going to come along and sing to us personally. Mm. So that's as far as it went, so I said, oh. And uh, it got so on the road when we were doing the, the tour, that when we realised Glenn couldn't do it anymore, I said to David, give us that phone number, and I, I called, I got the manager to call Ray, mm. and arranged to see him in New York, when we were playing in New York, to see him in a hotel there. So I met him at the hotel, and, um, and everything seems to go, he seemed a nice chap, and, you know, he just seemed to know what he was talking about. And so I arranged for him the next two days to come along to the show. He came to the show on the evening in New York, and he came, um, to the next two dates with us. Um, Glenn went separately in a car with his bodyguard. Was Glenn Hughes aware that this guy was no, hanging he wasn't, about? No, because we sent Glenn separately in a car oh, with the bodyguard. And um, 
So the chap travelled on the, on the bus with everybody else and got familiarised with the songs as we went on. And we got to the rehearsals, uh, to the, uh, the, the show, and then had a sound check in the afternoon and tried him. And uh, tried a couple of numbers on the afternoon, he was good. I think everybody at the show must have been thinking, what's going on here, all the crews and all the, you know, the other band must have been thinking, what's happening? Must There's have been strange, yeah. up there, you know. I didn't do a sound check at the Meadowlands because Ray Gillum was like rehearsing with them. Ah, uh, you know, your, I'm your saying I love because Ray was a good friend yeah. of mine. And by the time we hit Worcester, Massachusetts on row six, uh, on show six, after that show, which by the way now I couldn't even. <laughs> nothing's nothing coming, was out, coming yeah. out. Um, I was in a room at, after the part after the show and, and somebody I heard somebody talking about the new singer to replace Glenn and my ears went hello and I, I could see it was a really good looking guy travelling with us and I'm going I said to him hi man I'm Glenn he said I'm Ray he, he, he didn't tell me but somebody told me in that room that night that this man was replacing me because I was going to be sent home I didn't know that, that I had blood in my throat and so when when Tony thought it best for a replacement to come in, uh, then I went to see a doctor in Worcester, and they they, they did a, a a check on my on my nose and throat, and I it was caked with dried blood, and I I, I was really upset, but in in a way I'm going, this is actually best for Sabbath as a family. While Ray Gillen was chosen, there was another singer who was looked at. Tony Martin was a young singer that was working his way up the ladder, who at the time was being managed by a school friend of Tony Iommi's, there was much interest in Tony Martin, but Ray was chosen in part because he was closer and did not need a work visa, but Tony Martin will come up again. Ray Gillen would finish out the rest of the tour, giving Tony Iommi a renewed sense of energy, plans were made for Ray to continue on to the next album.